Hey everybody, Tom Cherry Holmes here with the FujiNet Project, and I wanted to make a quick video showing various Atari quirks that might confuse both new Atari 8-bit users and returning Atari 8-bit users who have forgotten these quirks and the solutions to them. Most commonly, if you have an Atari XL or XE series system, you have a machine with a built-in BASIC cartridge, which is part of the operating system ROM. It is disabled by holding down the option key when cold starting the machine. This is important for certain applications which need the memory which would otherwise be used up by the BASIC cartridge for their own use. To demonstrate this, we will actually take and load a game from ataryapps.irata.online by selecting the host slot, pressing return, going to the games folder, pressing return again, pressing return for the A8P folder here, and tapping F for filter so that we can search for Jumpman. For files that begin with Jumpman and end with whatever, using the asterisk key. We then select the ATR file here, press return. Press return to mount this into drive slot 1, because Atari expects anything it expects to boot to be in drive slot 1. Press enter to mount it read only. Then press tap the option key to boot. Now because I tapped the option key, and I'm not going to hold down the option key, the built-in BASIC will be inserted for me automatically by the computer, and we will see an interesting message when it comes up. We can see right here it's telling us to remove all cartridges. Because we didn't disable the BASIC cartridge, the XL machine inserted it for us. The solution here is to hold down the option key while cold starting the machine, which can be done in one of two ways. Either by power cycling the machine, that is, turning it off and then turning it on again, or in the case of where we are right now, because the, because the bootload did not complete, it is very likely that if I tap the reset key while holding down the option key here, that a cold start will happen. And because I'm holding the option key down, it will disable the basic for me. Doing this, we see that basic is disabled and the game loads as expected. If you use Atari DOS 2.0 or any DOS that's based on Atari DOS 2.0, such as Atari DOS 2.5, OSS OSA Plus version 2, or OSS DOS XL version 2, you will undoubtedly run into this error if you try to use more than two drives under these operating systems. This is because this disk operating system only allocates as much memory as needed to support a certain number of drives. However, again, this is easy enough to fix. We'll start by going into the SD card slot here, on which we have three DOS disks which are all copies of their original master disks. All three of these DOSs have been configured for two drives. I'm going to select DOS 2.0, press return, mount it into slot 1, and mount it as read-write, pressing W, because we are going to modify it. But we're also going to create three work disks. I'll say work 1, which is a 90K disk 
that will go into drive two. And I'll do the same thing for work two and work three. And put them into three and four respectively. We can check that everything is OK by pressing the escape key to go back out into the host slot screen. And we see our four disks, our DOS disk in drive one, and our three work disks in two, three, and four, mounted and ready to go. I will then tap the option key to boot everything. Because I didn't hold down the option key, the basic is enabled, and we will be presented with a ready prompt. That is OK. We'll be back here in just a moment because we're actually going to use basic to patch the DOS. But for now, let's go into DOS by typing DOS and press return. For DOS 2, this loads the disk utility package which is a menu of commands that can be used to manipulate disks as well as the files on those disks. We can do things like listing the directory. Pardon the noise there, guys. But we need to now initialize the three disks that we've created because they're blank and they don't have any file system on them. We'll initialize what's in drive 2. Because DOS 2 is configured for two disks, this works as, as expected. And if we do a directory on drive 2, we'll see that it's completely empty and ready to be filled with 707 free sectors. However, if we try to initialize what's in drive 3, we will immediately get an error 160, which is a drive number error, because these dr this drive is not configured. The same for drive four. And because only four drives are supported in DOS 2.0 and 2.5, if I try to do anything higher, then DOS will helpfully tell me that I can only support D1 through D4 anyway. How do we fix this? We fix this by going into the cartridge, which in this case is the built-in basic. The value that we need to actually change in memory is location 1802, which we can look at with the peak function. Let's have a look and see what the value is in there right now. The value that's currently in there right now is 3, which if you were to express 3 as a binary number, it would essentially look like the bottom two bits are what's enabled, corresponding to drives 1 and drives 2. If we set this to 15, for example, using the poke command, we set all four of the four lowest bits and indicate to DOS that there are four drives present. We can look at the value now that we've poked it to indicate that this is OK, everything looks good. And at this point, we can go back to DOS and write out our modified DOS, which now will have support for four drives when we boot it again. We use the H command for write DOS files, specify that we want to write to drive one, press Y to indicate that we, yes, this is affirmatively what we wish to do, and the modified DOS is then written out to disk in whole. Two files are written in the case of DOS 2, DOS sys, which is the file management system, and DUP sys, which is the menu that you're interacting with right now. If we look at the resulting directory, we can see that the files are the same size and not much has fundamentally changed. But if I go ahead and force a cold start, which I'm going to do now by running at address E477 and boot the result, we won't see much of a difference from basic, except now that 1802 is now our new value. 
15. And when we go to DOS, we will find that when we try to format drive 3, that it is now successful. The same with drive 4. We can now look at the directories of those and we can see that everything works as expected. I'm now going to press the reset button on my FujiNet so that we get back into config and use the same cold start command as before to boot the system, this time back into config, because this time we're going to select DOS XL version 2. We go ahead and press enter to select what's on my SD card. We move down to select DOS XL, press return again, press enter to put it into slot one, changing out what's already there, press W for read write, and tap option again to boot. DOS XL, unlike DOS 2, is a command line DOS and that you type out your commands rather than selecting them from a menu. Although, DOS XL does indeed have a menu here. We're going to hit Q to quit. And we see that we're back at the command prompt here. I can, of course, go to drive 2, do a directory, and we can see the directory of drive 2. However, if I try to do a directory on drive 3 or drive 4, for example, where I know that there are disks, I will get a drive number error, which is the error 160 as before. We patch it in exactly the same way. By going to car for cartridge, and we poke in a new value. DOS XL is kind of special in that it actually can support up to eight drives. That means if you were to turn on all eight possible drive associations, the value would be not 15, but 255. And this time we're actually going to do this all in one command from basic to patch the value and overwrite them out. And actually before we do this, let me double check something. I think the DOS sys file is protected. It is. You see the asterisk here? That indicates that the file is protected and we can deal with that just fine by unprotecting the file. Now we can go to cartridge. We'll poke in the new value. And I'm using a trick here that's rather unique to Atari DOS 2 and its derived operating systems. If Atari DOS 2 detects that you are trying to open DOS Sys for writing, it assumes that you want to write a new copy of a DOS to a disk and make that disk bootable. We do the close number one to indicate to, to correctly close the file and flush everything out and make sure that everything is written as expected. Now that this is done, this is all we need to do. And actually now, if I go to DOS and run E477, which is exactly the same as using the M command in DOS 2, we'll do a cold start and see the difference. We'll see a slightly longer boot time because now DOS XL is initializing a lot more drives and needing to check status on each of these. And this is very, uh, very, very noticeable the first time you go to the command processor from the menu. But now, if I go to drive three, 
you'll see that the drives work as expected. And in fact, if I were to have something in drive 8, for example, it would also work. But here is an important distinction. On the FujiNet, if you have nothing in a drive slot, it is not only as if the drive is open, it is as if the drive is not turned on at all. So there's nothing to respond to a command. Therefore, you get a Raspberry. Just so you know. Finally, with DOS 2.5, they finally decided to add in a menu program to help automate the configuration of how many drives are present in a system, as well as a few other small parameters as well, without needing to resort to poke statements. We can see that as we boot DOS 2.5, again, mounting is read-write. And this time, since we won't need BASIC to patch these values, I can hold down Option and keep it held down to disable BASIC. We'll see here, because I held down the Option key, that it immediately bounces into the Disk Utility Package. Looking at the disk directory, we see a number of rdos and dup sys, but we also see some utilities here. The one we're interested in is setup.com. If we use the L command to load it, followed by the file name setup setup.com, we will go into the setup program. This is a menu basically allowing you to set various system configurations as well as creating an auto-run sys for certain boots, such as initializing an Atari 850 interface or for automatically loading a program. In our case, we want to change the system configuration, so we press option number two. And if we look at what's configured here so far, what we're interested in ultimately is the active drives field. Right now, only two drives are active and we would like all four possible drives to be active. So to the question it's asking here, do we want to change anything? Yes, we do. And we want to set the drive numbers we want active. So I go ahead and type all four drives. Press return. And how many files do we want to have open simultaneously? The more files you can have open simultaneously, the more buffers are needed for each of those. Uh, simultaneous open IOCBs. So, three is a good number. Do you want disk writes to occur without verify? Yeah, sure. So we don't need it anyway. Are you sure this configuration is what you want? Yes. Parent system configuration has been changed. Do you want to write it? Again, yes. At which point we can then press start to go back to the main menu and press zero to go back to DOS. Yes to go back to DOS start to say we really want to go back to DOS. Now once this is done, again, the DOS file has been changed, but it hasn't been loaded in, so we need to actually, again, force a cold start. I'll hold down the option as I do this, and let go. Now when we try to access the other disks, we can do so. Sparta DOS X needs special consideration. And because Sparta DOS X takes over the machine early on during the boot process, we needed to create a special way for Sparta DOS X to be able to come online and to be able to use the FujiNet uh, effectively since booting into config is actually a very awkward thing. So to do this, we actually took and created a DOS2 file system on the config disk that's loaded by default when FujiNet cold starts. 
We'll start by going ahead and going into Sparta DOS X. I'll select it on my ultimate card here. And we'll see now that this is selected, when we do a directory, actually, you'll see that the last thing that was mounted is the DOS2 disk that we had mounted. However, if I take and press the reset key on the FujiNet, you'll actually see the FNC tools. And actually, if I go ahead and do an FM all, it will mount everything that's currently in the device slots into place. So you'll see where we were before. As you can see, we'll go ahead and press reset again on the FujiNet and we get back access back to the factory disk. It's a good idea to copy this onto any hard disk that you may have so that you can easily access these functions, such as listing the device slots, listing the host slots, and so on. Hopefully, this has been a good little tutorial here showing you uh, some of the quirks that you can come up against when first coming to grips with FujiNet, either as a new Atari user or as a returning one. And I'll be making more of these videos to take and further iron out some of these issues as users report things that they stumble on. So until next time, guys, have fun.